Hello, I'm Yanis Simonidis. Today we continue with our new cycle of programs titled Holy Cross Live, which are designed to introduce you to the basic teachings of Christian Orthodoxy. In the course of these programs, we have been talking with clergy and lay theologians who currently teach at Hellenic College and the Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Both institutions are located on a beautiful campus in Brookline, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Our topics range from orthodoxy and ancient faith for the modern world, the art of the Orthodox Church, church and life issues, prayer and fasting, and today's program, Worship the Soul of Orthodoxy. Worship, it is at the very heart of Christianity. Through worship in general and the sacraments in particular, the faithful experience a personal relationship with God. Our guests today are His Excellency Metropolitan Dimitrios, a distinguished professor of biblical studies and Christian origins, and Reverend Dr. Alkiviadis Kalivas, the Dean of Holy Cross School of Theology and Professor of Liturgics. Father Kalibus, Your Excellency, welcome. It is good to see you again. Father Kalibus, if I may start with you, you recently wrote an article specifically describing the basic elements and structure of Orthodox worship. Can you tell us what they are? Yes. As you mentioned earlier, Orthodoxy has worship as its basic experience. It's the central activity of the church. And there are many expressions in worship and many elements. The major components that make up the worship of the church are involved in at least the five following uh, things. First, we have sacramental services and rituals and Eucharistic liturgies. Second, we have a daily cycle of worship or a daily office. Third, we have a calendar of feasts and fasts. Fourth, a lectionary system by which the church exposes the faithful to the Word of God. And finally, we have a distinctive use of liturgical space, a distinctive arrangement of the church, as well as a distinctive use of liturgical gestures and the liturgical art forms, such as music, iconography, and architecture. Mm -hmm. All these five major components which constitute the expressions of our liturgical tradition are sometimes known by liturgists as the rite of Constantinople or the Byzantine rite. And this expression of worship constitutes the unification of the liturgical usages of the Orthodox Church. Our calendar of feasts and fast, uh, the cycle of feasts and fasts uh, can be described very briefly in two large groups, the so-called fixed feasts and the so-called movable feasts. The movable feasts are based uh, chiefly on the celebration of Pascha, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, His crucifixion, His resurrection. And because Pascha or Easter uh, is a movable date, so every feast connected with that, the celebration of Pascha, is considered part of the movable cycle. The others are fixed feasts. They occur on the same day, same date, uh, each month of each year. 
In general, the feasts cover events in the life of our Lord, just as I mentioned Pascha, his resurrection, his crucifixion, of the transfiguration, the Annunciation, feasts connected with the uh, Our Lady, the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, Saint John the Baptist, the other saints of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the martyrs and confessors of the, mm. of the faith, and other events in sacred history. Uh, also interspersed throughout the year are uh, feasts, uh, I'm sorry, fasts, uh, such as the Great Lent, uh, the fast before Christmas, and then every week we have a cycle of feasts. Uh, the weekly cycle begins with the celebration of Sunday, the Lord's Day, the Kiryaki Imara, especially through the celebration of the Eucharist. It is the weekly commemoration of the resurrection. And throughout the week, we also have, uh, throughout the year, every uh, week, with some exceptions, there is a weekly fast on Wednesday and Friday. Now, before we go into number four and five, the, uh, the liturgical books and the, uh, the, the space, the liturgical space, Your Excellency, let me ask you, if I may, how biblical is our worship in terms of content, in terms of continuity uh, uh, with the ancient, ancient worship? This is a very good question and a very substantive one because sometimes people have the, uh, not a complete, not a clear idea about the, the real contents in terms of continuity and relationship to the biblical texts. Uh, in fact, we can see two basic things. One, in terms of continuity, since we know that uh, the early church somehow was a, uh, comprising members, former members of the Jewish communities, the Lord himself, the apostles, were Jewish people. Therefore, they were very familiar with established patterns and models of worshiping in Israel. Mm. So it was very natural to use all this type of uh, worship and with some adaptations then continue it. What were, what were the main elements here? First, the usage of scriptural texts, especially from the book of Psalms. The Psalms were spread all over the types of worship that occur, morning, evening, festivals, big festivals, whatever it is. Psalms, but in addition to Psalms, other biblical readings from the prophets and from the Torah, the law, the law of Moses, like the Decalogue. Uh, two, they were the, the, the part which is the petition part. In other words, a prayer that asks God for a number of things pertaining to personal, family, city, nation questions or needs, or doxologies, petitions and doxologies. And third, you have the hymnic material, just the singing, the hallelujahs and all these kind of things which are which were very, very prominent in the life of Israel. So the, the early church picks up, up these elements and of course, there is a big step here, that is the addition, which is the Eucharist. The Eucharist gives a totally new dimension, but the new dimension is not rejecting the previous forms, it's simply incorporating, modifying them, and simply create a new hall in which former Jewish elements are visible, but new elements like the prominence of the Eucharist is also visible. So in terms of continuity, you have a very direct continuity. We have to ask, I'm not a, an expert in the field, but we have to ask some of the musicologists to tell us if the music and how much the music is influenced. Some people would insist that quite a large part of the music still goes. Is, <coughs> is related to a continuity. Now, the other part is the very biblical element in terms of the, the specific services sure. as they occur. Let's take an example which is very known to all the people who are listening and viewing this nice uh, interview that we have here. Let's say Sunday morning. You start with the matins and we end with the liturgy. How much Bible do we have there? The people would say immediately, we read the gospel, of course, and the, and the epistle, of course. But it's much more than that. 
We start with the so-called exapsalmos. We read six psalms in the beginning of the matrix. Then you have the anavathmi or the ascent, hymns of ascent, which are very much influenced by biblical language. You have the katavasis. The katavasis are modeled after nine Old Testament, eight Old Testament, one New Testament biblical texts. Mm -hmm. The Ode of Moses, the Ode of prophets, uh, Prophetess Hannah, the uh, Ode of Isaiah, etc. So this is, a, again, a biblical thing. You read the Gospel in the Martins, which is a biblical text. And after that, you read Psalm 50, which is a biblical text. You continue <laughs> with the uh, Megalinaria, which contain parts of the, uh, the famous hymn of the Mother of God, which appears in the Gospel of Luke. You reach the, uh, the hymns before the doxology. Doxology is a compilation of biblical and parabiblical texts. And uh, before the, uh, the doxology, you have the, uh, the any, which are the praises, again, small hymns, headed by Samic texts. So the whole matter is, is just permeated step after step with biblical material. You read the liturgy, you have the same thing, not only with the two gospel, reading gospels, not only with repetition of Psalm 50, when the, the priest is preparing for the, uh, to instance the people uh, before the great entrance. Then if you have a critical edition of the text of the liturgy, and there is a, such a critical edition, and in the margin of this edition, you have next to each phrase, each sentence used by the celebrant or by the cantors, you have a possible biblical connection. You'd be amazed. The whole margin is filled with citations. There is, even if you take, take the, the, the prayer of the anaphora that Father uh, Kalivas mentioned before, and you take it phrase by phrase, you can say, Luke 5, 1, Exodus 5, 10, Isaiah 25, 3. I mean, you go continuously right. to biblical text. So here you have this kind of very rich material. Let me add one more, mm -hmm. which also people perhaps are not aware of. When the celebrant priest, deacon bishop, is putting on his vestments, he recites some prayers. All of them are 100% excerpt from either Psalms or Prophet Isaiah or other biblical texts, all of them. May I add something yes. here that I think might be of some uh, interest to people? There is always this sense that uh, early Christian worship was very, very simple and austere. And I think from what the Metropolitan has said, we can gather, as well as from so many documents of early uh, Christian uh, literature, that uh, Early Christian worship, in fact, was quite elaborate. It had a system of worship that is very clear to us from early documents, but it is abundantly clear because of the connection with, the ancient, with ancient Israel. Mm -hmm. The synagogue worship, the temple worship was very rich and replete, mm -hmm. and so we have inherited that, uh, that uh, tradition mm -hmm. uh, from, from ancient Israel. Let, right. let me add one yes. more uh, item, which is, might be of a uh, uh, minute kind of situation, but it's, it's, I think it's significant. The fact that we have the gospel deposited, resting all the time on the holy altar. We don't bring the gospel during the service here. It's always on the holy altar. That's not accidental. It shows the just impossibility of disconnect the gospel message from the performance of the heart of the liturgy, which is the Eucharist. So it's forever there. Now, to both of you, what about the architecture uh, of the church? What about the art of our church? Hymnology, iconography, in terms of worship. And, and, and you, see, you, you touched on some of those elements mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the ancient uh, musical tradition in, in, in the, in the Jewish. Liturgical world. space is very important to the Orthodox and the building, the way it is arranged, the way it is decorated, uh, conveys the essence of the worship experience for the Orthodox Christian. For example, there's much more attention paid to the church within its decoration, its arrangement, in order to indicate 
that the world is brought into the church in order to be transformed and transfigured, in order for it to become a bearer of the Spirit. And so the way the church is decorated within indicates a sense of beauty and harmony uh, that speaks of the transfiguration of the world. Secondly, the way we have arranged the liturgical space indicates a continuity, uh, a distinction of order and service within the church, uh, that all people who constitute the liturgical assembly have a role to play within it. Uh, these roles are distinct, but there is no division per se between clergy and laity, but together they constitute the church mm -hmm. and the people of God. Uh, the bishop mentioned before the vestments and that certain prayers uh, taken from the Psalms or from the other parts of the Old Testament are said. The vestments that the priest wears are not to separate him from the people as much as to make more evident the new life in Christ, uh, the new life that we are all called to participate in. For example, the basic vestment of the clergy, the stichario, is the baptismal garment of all Christians, mm -hmm. always light colored, always bright colored. Uh, the uh, foci of the temple, uh, the pulpit from which the scriptures are read and the scriptures are explicated, uh, are closely related to the holy table mm -hmm. where the Eucharist is celebrated. Uh, the essential characteristic of the Eucharist as a meal is maintained because we call this in most important part of the church building, we call it a table, the holy table, mm -hmm. reminiscent of the Last Supper. And then the icons in the church. And the way they are arranged. Oh, well, no, that's the iconography. So. Well, the way they are arranged also speaks to us about uh, certain very basic things uh, concerning worship. But the icons, too, depict the transfigured human being, uh, the transfigured world. The music of our church is unique. It has its own character, as well as the architecture of the church. The basic concept in the architecture of our church is to indicate very clearly a sense of communion, the embracing love of God. If I may add yes. something to the, uh, the iconography that you mentioned before, uh, it's important that uh, in, in the um, traditional Orthodox churches, almost every part of the wall is covered with iconography. And this iconography first covers almost the entire history of the Old Testament, then it covers again, the basic items and the basic uh, points in the life of Christ, the Lord, and then it goes to the life of the church and the saints and martyrs. Now, what we have historically is this. In, in, for many centuries, in large Orthodox countries, there was no way for the people to be educated, to go to the universities, to learn theology or, or religion. Whatever they had, it was just by going to the worship and looking at the icons. And Yet they were, they were so well educated in terms of, of Christianity because they had this constant visual contact through the icons of the realities of faith. So for Orthodox, the iconography is an absolutely important thing, not to talk about aesthetics involved and the, the, uh, the ideal and the picture of human beings as depicted in the iconography. You go from era to era, from school to school, and you can see there changing understandings of what a human being is as illuminated by faith. It's a very, very interesting phenomenon. There's a couple of other things important to this aspect. And first, um, the sense of continuity of the Old Testament, the New Testament. Mm -hmm the life through the centuries of the church. The church is rooted in antiquity, is rooted in the very life of Christ, is rooted, I would say, even in paradise. All this is depicted through this continuity, even through the iconographic scheme, mm -hmm. but also the use of icons in the church 
the use of matter to be spirit-bearing has a, an important message to the world, that all matter is important, that the world has value, that this world requires of us not exploitation, not poisoning of the environment, but the environment must be looked upon as a creation of God and must be honored and valued as God's gift to humankind. And so the use of matter in the Orthodox Church also allows us to appreciate the creation of God and take joy in it. We say soul of orthodoxy. I'm going to take a little more time to explore a few things, very few. Uh, why then, in the context of what we just talked about, why is worship the soul of orthodoxy? Why is it so important in our faith? Well, because With the, all the elements because that the church, you described. Because the from her very, from the, from her very beginning, experienced herself in an attitude of prayer before God. Worship allows us to touch prayer, allows us to touch the ultimate frontier, and even to cross that frontier. We are in another world, in the divine world. We are in, an, in a communion and in an encounter with the living God. That's one, one reason. The second reason is that orthodoxy has treasured up her faith in her worship. You open up any of the liturgical books and you are placed immediately in contact with the fundamental beliefs of the church. Mm -hmm. Orthodox worship, her hymnography, is first and foremost an expression of her faith, of her doctrine. That's why worship is a lead to her mind. It's the face of orthodoxy. You see worship and you see the Orthodox Church. You see Christianity in its fundamental expression. Mm -hmm. I would think this would be one way of yes, helping yes. you see that. Your Excellency wanted, you yeah, wanted I to would add like yes. to, If I may, I would like to add something uh, to the point of why worship is the soul of orthodoxy, as Father Kalivas mentioned a few things. Also, the fact that orthodoxy recognizes as a, as a basic, as a fundamental characteristic of human beings, the possibility to worship, to adore God. And this is why even, even sociologists uh, come to the point of recognizing man, human being, as a homo adorans, the mm -hmm. worshiping, the adoring person. Mm -hmm. and, and Orthodox is very serious about that because this is, this is a, a fundamental, basic need for us to express ourselves in the ultimate, superb way of worship, and, and this is worship, to adore someone, and, and in, this is God. In, in all our capabilities, our capability to sing, Precisely. to paint, to, to commune, to... to uh, uh, you wanted to say something? Exactly. Yeah. So that that's, that's right. was the point right. I would now. like to make. And, and, and that explains also the aspect of beauty mm. and all-encompassing possibilities in the worship. You have something that should be superbly beautiful and whole. That's splendid. Okay. If we were, last question, if we were to both of you, we were to enhance as, as celebrants, as faithful, our worship life, what should we do? Well, I think uh, just taking something, a cue from what the bishop has said, it's so important for us to recognize that worship, latria, the Greek word, really means to serve, to be a servant, to be obedient, an obedient servant which really means that worship is fundamentally a response to God, a response to, of obedience to his commandments, which opens up life and transforms life. Commandments of God are not limiting. They, are, they make life freeing. expansive, freeing, mm -hmm. liberating. Mm -hmm. Worship can be enhanced when the human being is in fact always doing that which he has been created for to encounter the living God in prayer. And that takes place in the home as well as in the church, in private or personal um, prayer as well as the communal prayer of the church. Both are needed, both are essential. And I think a home that has a private sanctuary that allows the members of the family uh, to repeat the prayers of the church and then their own petitions and their own needs uh, is very substantial. Then the prayer that takes on the form of charity, of philanthropy, the prayer that is concerned for the issues that, uh, that human beings deal with every day in their life, 
uh, helps the prayer, the communal prayer, and also gives expression to prayer as not simply only words, but actions in the life mm -hmm. of, of, of each individual. Yeah. Well, if I may add yes. uh, one or two more things to what uh, Father Kaliva said already. The, uh, here we have, first of all, the basic perhaps way to enhance prayer is to educate our people, train our people to pray. Prayer is something that has to do with the whole human being and has to be a spontaneously uh, coming out activity, but it's something also that is a result of training, of education. And this education of how to pray, what to pray, of having prayer and worship as a personal encounter with God. Many people go to the church and if you ask them, well, are you going to encounter God in the church? They say, what do, you, what do you mean by that? I'm going to just be in the liturgy. No, prayer and worship is, is a personal encounter with God, with a community. Then worship, enhancing of worship is to make God the real significant other. Think who is the significant other in our life and say, no, the worship emphasizes God is the significant other. And that's will, an important thing. I will take that statement as our final statement. I don't think we can do any better <laughs> than this statement because of, we've run out of time. Thank you ever so much. Uh, it is a, a complex issue and we've just touched on it, but I think it is important that we, we communicate some of the basic aspects. You've been watching Holy Cross Live and we have had the uh, honor to have uh, His Excellency Metropolitan Demetrius and Father Kalivas with us. And this is Yanis Simonidis for Illuminations. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>